Okay, so hello again everybody. This is uh, Sean Mullery from Electronic Engineering at IT Sligo. And in this lecture uh, from Multiview Geometry and Computer Vision, we're going to be looking at 2D geometric transformations. So this is quite a, a short lecture here. We'll only have, um, we have about 12 slides and I think in the version that uh, you guys have at home, you probably have a few, you, well, no, actually no, I think you, you have all the slides in this one. I don't know that I've added any uh, drawings in here. This is relatively simple. Going back, I, I can't remember who was asked the question. I'm feeling it was Niall, but I'm not sure about CAD models. So what you're going to see here is uh, a lot to do with the idea of uh, what you would see in two-dimensional uh, computer aid design, where you have you know squares and shapes like that, and you want to move them to some other place, or you want to change their shape in some way, and what transform they would undergo in order for that to happen. So this is very much two-dimensional and later on we're going to have to work on three-dimensional and how how that operates. So where this, just to kind of give you an, uh, an idea of where the subject is going here, within an image we expect things to move in a kind of a two-dimensional way, but the images are, their photographs or, or you know, uh, maybe video from a camera that's, that has a certain perspective. So it's looking at a three-dimensional world. So we need to know about how things would then, you know, how things would, mark, uh, would, would move in three dimensions. But not just that, we need to know how that would appear to the camera. So there's an, uh, there's an apparent motion that will come into this as well, where we'll, we'll need to get an idea of what does, uh, uh, you know, th 3D motion in the 3D world, that's actually not too bad. But, but determining what that looks like from different camera views that's a little bit more involved. And that's where we're going eventually. But first we need to just look at simple ideas like two-dimensional geometric transformation. So there's not a lot in this set of slides in terms of the things we'll be going through, but there is a lot of good ideas in it. And from this is where we will build onto three dimensions and so on. And um, so it is an important one to kind of uh, get your head around it first. So, so far, all we've done is make changes to the range of an image. Now, remember what I mean by the range of an image is um, we have our X and our Y coordinates that we put in to find out where in the image we are, but then we have the brightness value, which is what we call the range of the image, okay? And the um, what we looked at previously was changing the brightness value in some way, but we're not looking at moving things about in the image. We haven't looked at that at all yet. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. That idea of that, that shapes and so on would move within the image. Okay. And oftentimes what we're really trying to determine here is how that shape is going to move from one image to another image. Uh, so that we can get an idea of, um, did something in the 3D world move? Did we move? And therefore something in the 3D world appeared to move relative to us. And can, from that, can we figure out something about three-dimensional geometry and so on, okay? Uh, did I put my, did I leave my camera off there, but there you guys, I forgot to put it back on again, but I'll, I'll knock it on there again. Okay, so you have that there again. Okay, so, uh, um, so we're only looking at change in intensity values in the image, but we can also move pixels from one place to another uh, and some general examples are we might want to rotate something, we might want to warp it in some way, or we might want to enlarge or reduce it. So we have a mathematical characterization of this, and I'm going to show you a diagram of this in a moment. But firstly, we've got translation, and translation preserves orientation. Uh, it preserves the length of lines. So when we do a translation, the length of lines don't change. Their orientation doesn't change. So they don't get they don't get rotated or anything like that. The angles between lines don't change. Parallelism is uh, preserved as well. So if a line, if two lines are parallel before they were translated, they will be parallel after they're translated. And straight lines remain straight lines. And you're going to see that straight lines is actually the one that, that gets preserved by everything, by all of our different type of um, transformations. But translation is the simplest of the, tra of the transformations, and it preserves all of these things. Rigid body motions or rigid motions, Euclidean motions, there are several different names here. They preserve everything the translation did except for orientation. Okay, which means that things can get oriented into, you know, they, they can get rotated and so on. Okay, uh, so I'm going to show, uh, maybe it's best if I show you the diagram here so that you get, get a sense of it and maybe we'll pop back to that. So if we take my, my original here, this is my original, 
my original uh, uh, rectangle there. If I translate it, what I do is I move its position, but I don't change its orientation. Okay, so that point there, uh, I'll maybe take a red, that point there moves along there and up to there. Okay, so we can see that it moves along there and up to there. Um, so it moves a certain amount on the X and a certain amount on the Y, but it doesn't, it doesn't rotate in any way. Now, if we look at our example of rigid body motion, we can see that this point here has moved to this point here. To that point there. We can see that movement that's taken place there. But we also see that this has changed its orientation here. Okay, so what has been preserved from the original is that the lengths of each of the lines have not changed. Okay, so they have been preserved in a rigid body motion. And rigid body motion means exactly as it says, if I, if I take my, my, something like my mobile phone here, this is rigid body motions that, I'm, that we're undergoing here because I haven't changed the physical dimensions of the phone. I haven't managed to make it longer or shorter or squashed it or anything like that. I haven't changed it in any way, but I can change its, its orientation and I can change its position. So that's what we have with rigid body motion. And of course, because we have maintained, um, uh, we've maintained the lengths of the lines, we've also maintained the angle between them. That's important. That's not necessarily guaranteed by just maintaining the length of the lines because of course we could have a parallelogram or something like that that maintained the length of the lines, but um, that also means that we've retained the area within the within it and so on, okay? So we can think of, and you can see all the different things that have been retained. Parallelism has been retained as well. Parallel, any, any line that was parallel, so that line there was parallel with this line, that's still the case, that line is parallel with that line. This one with this, this one is this one with this one. So you can see that all of those things have been retained, okay? So the next one then is similarity. Um, and in maths, uh, this, you know, this idea of similar triangles or similar rectangles and so on, it, it has particular mathematical definitions, but you can think of that, it's, it looks similar in shape. So what gets preserved here? Well, we can see that, uh, so in other words, this position has moved to this position here. So um, it can be rotated. So clearly we haven't preserved its orientation, okay? Um, what, else is, what else has changed? Well, the lengths of the lines have changed. So it hasn't preserved length, okay? But angles have been retained. So it has preserved those. Um, it has preserved parallelism. Okay, and straight lines are still straight lines. So it's preserved all of those three. So if we look at it here, we can see that similarity preserves angles, preserves parallelism, preserves straight lines. Okay, so you can see that the, the hierarchy that goes on here, that the top one preserves everything, the bottom one preserves the least of these. Now an affine motion then preserves parallelism and straight lines, but it doesn't guarantee to preserve anything else. So it can rotate, so we can change its orientation, it can change the lengths of the lines, that can happen, and the angles can change between them. So we can no longer rely on the angles being the same as they were. We can see that the angles have changed. But parallel lines are still parallel, okay? And um, we, can, we can see that straight lines are still straight lines, okay? So all of those things are still happening, okay? Now, the last one then is projective. And this is, uh, projective is what can, can happen um, when something is brought into a camera. Okay, so when we take an image of something, um, what, what happens to it? So we can see here that, well actually maybe you can tell me, um, what, what, gets, what gets preserved here? Can anybody see anything that gets preserved from, going from my original to my projective here? Is there anything that, that still is preserved? Yeah, straight, straight lines is preserved. Okay. Now, Vin has said sides, and yeah, we have the same number of sides. Um, so, okay. Um, 
So I'm not sure what you mean by circumference. Do you mean the the uh, the total length? No, that doesn't get preserved at all. We've no guarantee of that being preserved at all. Same as the similarity. We don't know that that's going to be done. So lengths don't get preserved in projective. In fact, lengths don't get preserved from anything back until, until rigid. It doesn't even get preserved in, in affine. So actually, the only thing that gets preserved is that they are still straight lines. We don't even get parallelism or any of that. Okay, so in a projective transform, that's the only thing that gets preserved. That can seem very, very limiting, but actually an awful lot of the work we're going to do relies on the fact that because straight lines are preserved, that that uh, that that allows us to do quite a lot of things, okay? Now, unfortunately, if you go beyond the standard camera model, which is kind of the pinhole model, and you go to things that have distortions, and you go to maybe these uh, fisheye lenses, then even in those, straight lines are not preserved, and then you're into a lot more trouble. But uh, in this course, we're, we're, we're going to be looking at the standard kind of pinhole model type things. We'll mention some of the other aberrations around that. Um, but we're going to be looking at when we maintain straight lines, what we can get away with. Okay. So there's the idea. Uh, projective preserves straight lines, whereas affine preserves parallel, parallelism and straight lines. Similarity preserves angles, parallelism and straight lines. Rigid body motion or Euclidean preserves length, angles, parallelism, parallelism and straight lines. And um, because it preserves length, that also preserves area. Or if it's, uh, if it's a 3D object, it preserves volume. Okay. And uh, translation then preserves orientation, length, angles, parallelism and straight lines. So it, it, it pre preserves them all. Um, I'm curious, would you know anything from last week uh, that I said about the eigenvalues of, let's say, a transform like the rigid body motion there? What would you be able to tell me about the eigenvalues of, of that transform? Because this will be a matrix transform. Yeah, so so Carl has said one, and that's that's now Maurice has said remain the same, but that that's basically telling you that the eigenvalues of the transform are one. In other words, that it doesn't change them in any direction. Yeah, so uh, so they're all one. And of course, if you have eigenvalues of all one, and it's in two dimensions, that means you have an area of one, which means that your area doesn't change. Um, it'll retain the area, and if it's uh, if it's in three D, it'll it'll be ones in every direction in the three directions, and that means that the volume will be retained. So in a rigid body motion, no matter what transforms I do on this in terms of rigid body rotation translation, I don't change the volume of it. Now similarity, obviously, clearly, if I make a a, a similarity one, I can make this phone smaller, which which isn't going. To I think I just come on to this section here about the translation. And um, so the matrix for this is fairly simple. It's a three by three matrix. And these, uh, we've got the, uh, the three ones down the middle, which would normally tell us the identity matrix. So if that was all we had and we just had zeros here and here, we would have absolutely no effect. So basically what those determine is direction. Uh, we, we stay the same going in, in each different direction. Okay. Um, so in other words, we don't uh, we don't rotate on the X, we don't rotate on the Y or on the Z for that matter. But we can move along the X and we can move along the Y, um, which is what the TX and the TY stand for. Now, what sometimes will happen is people will pl put these into block matrices. So you can see here that this, um, what we have here, sorry, I'll draw that a bit smaller actually, um, that bit there, what would you call that? If you just had that four by four there, what would you call that matrix? Yeah, two by two identity or the, the identity matrix. So that's all they've done. They've called that an I there. Um, and they've assumed that you can figure out from there that that's a two by two. That's not necessarily obvious. So you'd have to figure that, that out from other things. Um, we've got our translation vector here which is why it's given as a lowercase letter so it's a vector of tx and ty there and then what we've got is we've got a zero vector here that's transposed which is why it's a row vector and then we've just got a one there which is a one on its own okay now you can decide yourself as to whether that's an uh, um an easier way to write it or not i suppose in some ways it kind of gives us an impression of the different parts of it that we're dealing with so this obviously tells us that in the x and the y we don't move anywhere 
um, that's fine. Um, as in, when I say we don't move any, we don't rotate at all. Uh, we do move. The TX and the TY just cause, cause us to move either a certain amount in the X and a certain amount in the Y. Um, and of course, the other way we can do that is we can just write it as an I here and a T and not bother with this bottom line. And we give that as a two by three matrix. Um, now, I have a note written on the bottom and I'm not going to mention more about it until next, until the, the next set of, actually, is it the next set of lectures or the one after that, probably the one after that. Um, there's a thing called homogeneous coordinates and that's, we've put these things in homogeneous coordinates here, which is why I've actually gone for a three by three rather than a two by two. And the reason basically is that um, we, we've, we've got that idea of the MX plus C here, which is that, that plus on the end of it there, which is what I'm trying to, trying to add there. Um, sorry, I shouldn't really necessarily say, it. it's just in other words, something multiplied by something. I don't want to necessarily give you the, the, the idea that this is entirely uh, a, a straight line, but then this idea here uh, that the MX is something that would pass through the origin, whereas the plus C is a bit that, that you know, you would have a bias or an offset there. And the problem is with that is that that doesn't make it very easy to put into a matrix. So we put it into a matrix by putting this one here and allowing us to treat each thing as if it's a three vector rather than a two vector. Okay. So basically what I would do, and I've, I've given an example in this one, but not necessarily in the, in the ones that follow it, but you, you can just from there, you can figure it out. If I have a pixel at the two, three position, and I want to translate it five pixels on the X axis and four pixels on the Y axis, here is how I would do it. I would put five on the X, four on the Y. My, I would write down my pixel position as two, three, and then a one on the end. And this is the idea of the homogeneous coordinates. As I say, I'll be, I'll be doing a, a full set of a lecture on that or a good bit of a lecture on that later. Um, what I then do is we just, we just multiply this out in the standard way that we have done up until now. What we do is one by two is just going to be two. We've got two and um, we've got zero by three, which is zero. And we've got five by one, which is five. And as you can see that that is going to put me in position seven there. Okay. In the next, we've got zero by two, which is zero. One by three, which is three plus four by one, which is four. And that's going to put me in the seven position. So that's seven, seven. And I just have the zero, zero, one. So zero by two, nothing, zero by two, by three is nothing, and one by one is one, which gives me the one there. That's my homogeneous coordinate, and I can work very quickly back from that to the new coordinate that I have, which is basically going to be position seven, seven. Okay. What is worth your while once you look at these different transformations is pick some points like you as if you had these in a coordinate system in a CAD model or something like that. And see that when you operate this, that each of them moves to a different point and that you retain these straight lines or you retain each of the different things that you expected to retain. Um, so it is worth your while working through a few of these on paper so that you get a, a full a full sense of what's going on. I might just leave, leave well, I'll, I'll take some of this uh, mess off here, but I'll leave some of the other stuff there so that you know where the numbers came from. Is everyone happy enough where those numbers came from? You follow all that? It's fairly simple uh, matrix stuff, okay? So, the next one I'm gonna look at is rigid body motion, which is this idea um, uh, that we're going to maintain the shape, so it's, it's area in this case, because it's two dimensional, is not gonna change, but it can rotate. And the rotation is done by the following matrix. Instead of, we still have our TX and our TY, because we can translate it. And we separate those out as if they're completely separate in our matrix, uh, and that, that works quite well. So if, if we just want to rotate this and we don't want to translate it, all we have to do is set those both to, um, to zero, sorry. And that will be that job done. We don't translate in any direction at all, but we rotate. Now the rotation is you determine the angle there, theta, and it's the same angle as used in each of these cases. And it's cos theta minus sine theta, sine theta, cos theta, okay? Now, you would be forgiven if you're looking at that and going, well, how would I know that that's the order that they go in and so on, okay? So what I've done there is uh, down, down the bottom here, I have left a little um, link to a video by Patrick JMT, which is just his, his YouTube handle. Uh, I don't know what the JMT stands for. 
Um, he has a nice little just paper explanation. It goes on for about 15 or 20 minutes where he explains how we get to these different values here for doing the rotation. Uh, I'm not going to spend the time on it here because it, it, it would take me 15 or 20 minutes. So do go and watch that video if you want to see exactly how that works. Okay. So again, we can split this up into its different sections. We have its rotation section here and we have its translation section here. We've got our zero vector here that's uh, just been trans uh, trans uh, transposed. Sorry. Um, and we have a one there. Okay. Or we can write it in this way as well. Now, I should mention something about degrees of freedom, actually, and I, I didn't mention them here. Um, translation is just two degrees of freedom, which is the, basically the, the, the x and the y there, how far we translate in the x and the y. Nothing else can change there. So they, they're known as degrees of freedom. How many degrees of freedom do you reckon this rigid body one has? How many things can you see there that we can change? Okay, so uh, we're looking at the rigid here and we can see there we can change x and we can change y, but we can also change the value theta. Okay, so in this particular case, and this we wouldn't reduce volume here, uh, called so, so, so that's not what we're on yet. We're still on the rigid body motions here, but there are three things that we can change. You'll notice that the theta is the same value in the four positions that it's in, but there's three different values that we can set here. Therefore, we would refer to this as three degrees of freedom. Is everyone clear on what I mean by that? Have you got the sense of it now? Yeah, okay. So there's another point to mention here, which is that R is a rotation matrix and is orth an orthogonal matrix are sometimes called an orthonormal matrix. Um, the thing about the rotation is that uh, the rotation, as I said, its eigenvalue is going to be uh, plus one. In each case, it'll have two. This is a two-dimensional rotation, so uh, it's going to be um, two eigenvalues of plus one. The other thing about it is that the transpose of a the transpose of an orthogonal matrix is the same as the inverse of an orthogonal matrix. Okay, so uh, and that can be helpful when it comes to mathematical manipulation of these formulas. So or or transpose or or transpose or Either will work, we can do this in any order because the, the, by, by virtue of the fact that they are orthogonal, they're also always square. And they're so we, therefore, we can put them in either direction here. Um, and so if we multiply those by each other, we get the identity matrix. Okay, So, so the transpose is the inverse um, of the, uh, of the, the, sorry, the transpose is the, is the inverse of the, of the original matrix. Now, what that, that means is also that uh, if you do a rotation and you want to rotate it back to where you started, you just do the transpose matrix in order to get it back to where it started. And therefore, that's why it's called the identity. It's like we left the thing in the original position. Okay. Um, so that's that's the rotation matrix. Now, bear in mind that what that means, that's that bit of the matrix, not the full three by three here. Okay. Because if we have a translation in there, that's that's that doesn't that hasn't been taken into account here. Uh, but the rotation one itself. Um, does anyone, are you familiar with that that uh, that particular mathematical notation there for a matrix? Do you know what I mean by this? What does it mean then? I don't trust you. Yeah, it is the de the, the determinant determinant. Okay. So the determinant of a rotational matrix is one. And what that tells you is that obviously, uh, as you remember, the, the eigenvalues are both one. So we multiply one by one, we get one. So what that also tells you is that it preserves the area of whatever it is that you're dealing with. Okay, so when you move these things, you preserve the area. And we'll see in three dimensions when we've got these rotation matrices, they will, they will um, preserve the volume of whatever it is that we're, we're changing. Okay. 
If you're not familiar with those orthogonal matrices and so on, and you want to read up a bit more about them or watch a bit more about them, Gilbert Strang, who's the the textbook that I recommended for the, for the maths lecture, uh, as I say, it he also has all of his YouTube videos, all of his lectures up on YouTube as YouTube videos. Um, so you can you can uh, have a look at them there. And uh, I have a link there to the particular one where he talks about orthogonal matrices. All right. So the next one is similarity. And this is where we can change the size of it. Uh, so um, we can see there that what we've done, uh, just... Um, Let's say I have a, a sine wave, or just a, just a sinusoid. It doesn't have to be a sine wave or a cosine wave. It could be an addition of two of them or whatever. Um, so, you know, we've got like sine uh, 2 pi ft or something like that. Um, if I multiply by something here, so let's say I say s multiply by that, that s will determine the peak value of my sinusoid and by virtue of that it will change every other value uh, relative to that as well. So this is a scaling factor. Um, so these things um, by their very nature stick to within a value of one. They work on that unit circle idea uh, and therefore that's why we have this situation where those rotations are orthonormal that they, they you know they're not going to have a size that's bigger than one they always have a vector that's that's within that space it's always the, the the radius of a unit circle if i multiply it by s though uh, i've now made it not a unit circle i've made it a circle of radius s and so we can see there that what's going to happen is that if that s is bigger than one then i'm going to increase the size of this while rotating it i'm also going to increase the size of it in every direction and if it's smaller than one, I'm going to decrease the size of it uh, from that point of view. So that's why we see the, the R here, we see the R here written as a rotation matrix. It's still or, uh, an orthogonal matrix, but it's been multiplied by a scalar value S. A scalar value be just, being just a single value of S. All right, we'll ask the same question as we asked previously, which is how many degrees of freedom have I got this time? Furious counting going on here. Okay, I'm not going to tell you whether Vin is right or wrong. I want a few other people to give it a go. Don't be afraid of getting things wrong. Okay, so we've got a second vote of confidence uh, for for a four. So Niall is telling me what the different degrees of freedom are now. Hopefully. Yes, so Niall is saying the same as the last time, except that you can change the uh, you can change the size too. So that value s is now another degree of freedom. So we've got our tx, our ty, that's two. We've got our theta value, which, okay, it appears in four places, but it's the same value in each case. And the s is the same value in each case. Now, if I was allowed a different value of s in different places, what I would then be doing is I wouldn't have a similar thing. In other words, uh, when we have our similar similar what happens is that firstly our angles are preserved for starters but also the ratios of the lines with respect to each other is the same so uh you could think of this as something like aspect ratio or that that those ratios stay the same that won't happen if we choose um different values in these different positions okay uh, so the s is the scale factor so this is where we come on to the affine idea now this is very similar to the last one except any value can go here, 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 and here. So of course we can include our um, our uh, our sines and our thetas and so on. But now we've got different values of s, and so so we've got uh, completely different values that can go into these positions. And these can be absolutely arbitrary values as regards what actually goes in there for the sorts of changes that are going to occur. It will not affect parallelism though. Um, those lines will still be parallel to each other, but they can be uh, they can be moved to a different position. Um, their orientation can change, their lengths can change, and obviously, you know, they, they, it, uh, as I say, orientation the, 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 they can be uh, rotated or whatever. Okay. So with regard to this, and this this one is not as obvious because uh, those values can just be absolutely any arbitrary value that we want. How many degrees of freedom have we got this time? Oh, 
Okay, so we've quite different answers there. Now, is it, it is actually the, the first answer there of six is, is Olivia's come up with as well, is six is correct there. So we've one, two, three, four, five, six. So these are not, these are not uh, values that are set in stone or otherwise. Um, the, the, these are values that can be any variable value that we want. Uh, so this has six degrees of freedom um, that we can have, okay? And then if... Um, Obviously, when we come to doing these affine motions in the three dimensions, it'll have more than that again. Okay, but that's that's the idea for that. Now, this slide can seem like a little bit of, of clever mathematics and going a little bit over the top, but actually, um, and it's something that I've got from the, I've forgotten actually to put in, put in the, to, 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 to mention where I got it from, so I'll, I'll just write it here on the slide. This is from the uh, Hartley and Zitterman. I think that's where I got it from, Zisserman book, which is um, is on multiple view geometry, uh, and what they suggested is you know you you can break down the affine into its different component parts. Uh, we can so so the where the basically just the 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 section here, this A section here, which is just these four, this can be broken down into several different matrices, and we can do that via SVD. This doesn't want to play ball with me at all today. Um, using the SVD or the singular value decomposition. Now, as it happens, we're doing a singular value decomposition on something that has that has eigenvalues associated with it. So they're not. They're probably not even singular values. They're eigenvalues, and that's that's fine. Um, whereas oftentimes we do a singular value decomposition on something that isn't a square matrix, uh, or maybe doesn't have full rank or something like that. In which case, we're definitely dealing with singular values. Um, so it can be broken down into as into as follows, right? We can we can break it down here into the um, singular values or the the eigenvalues of this uh, this matrix here, which is sigma one and sigma two. We do a rotation of phi and a rotation of minus phi um, in in different orders, um, and what this basically means is that. Let's say I want to do some rotation, and I also want to change the the physicals the the physical size, and I want to change it by different sizes in different directions, okay? Which is what the affine one can do. Well, what we basically do is uh, so let's say we we have some some shape. Um, so we have some shape here like this. And, and what we want to do is we want to stretch it a different amount in this direction than in this direction. Okay, so what's going to happen here? Well, what this basically says is that it's the same as rotating by phi to bring us in line with the x and the y axis. Okay, so it brings us in line with the x and y axis. So basically what it does is it lines up the eigenvectors which are just the principal vectors of whatever this object is. So imagine I've got my, 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 my phone here and I have an eigenvector in that direction, and I've got one in this direction. And what I do is I just turn that by phi so that I line it up in the x and the y, y uh, directions. Okay. Once I've done that, what I can do is I can scale it. Um, so I scale it by this amount in one direction and this amount in the, in the other direction. So this amount in the x, x direction and that amount in the y direction. And they can be different amounts. And what I then do is I then... Once I've done my scaling, rotate it back to where it was, and then decide to do my original rotation that I wanted to do to some other place. So in other words, I do my sizing first, but I make sure I'm lined up with the X and the Y axis first to do my sizing properly, and then I rotate it back to where I was, and then rotate it to whatever angle I'd originally wanted to do. And all of that information is contained in this A matrix. We could just put it in as a pile of values, or we can think about it in these different ways. Now, why is this why is this helpful to know this? Partly it's helpful to know this to kind of get an idea of what the, the singular value decomposition actually does. And you, you often see this idea where you know we, we have a decomposition where we've got a U trans sorry, let me change back to this one. Um U transpose something like that. Um and, and a V here. Okay, so you, you, you split it up into, into some sort of a thing like that, and these are orthogonal matrices here. And you're kind of thinking, well, that's fine, but I don't really understand what's going on here. So you can see that this is actually, 
uh, quite a nice example of what it would look like geometrically for this thing to happen whereby we kind of rotate it we then we then make it different sizes on the different axes depending on the singular values that are in this but with our scaling values and then we we rotate it back another way uh, in order to get back to where we were and these could either be um u u and v could actually be the same if if it's an eigenvalue decomposition uh where you 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 normally have the q q transpose sigma q I can't remember, is it Q, Q sigma Q transpose? I think, I think it's Q transpose uh, sigma Q, um, but forgive me if I'm, I'm wrong, and if I've those the wrong way around. Um, but the, 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 the point here with, with, with those is that, uh, in other words, that in that case, it would be the exact same sort of rotation you're gonna be doing in each of those cases, and those will be or, orthogonal um, matrices, and therefore exactly the same as rotation. Or it could be a situation whereby you're rotating by a different amount in the different ones depending on whether you're doing a singular value decomposition and you're dealing with a with a matrix that um, maybe isn't full rank or something like that. So the reason that I've included this slide here is just to give you an idea of firstly all the different parts that play the role in coming up with these numbers which of course they all get jumbled together and put into a set of numbers but there is in certain cases a mechanism to pull apart that and try and determine each of the different movements that would have taken place and in what order they would have taken place um, but it's also a nice one just for maybe getting a, a geometrical understanding of what is happening when we do a singular value decomposition, how that breaks down. So that's really the reason I've done it. It's not for any sort of uh, cleverness beyond that. The final one then is the projective here. Um, so this is the projective transform. And uh, basically we just have a, a completely arbitrary set of, of, of values there for each of our points in our matrix. Um, this will maintain straight lines, um, but but nothing else. Points become points, of course, and lines become lines, um, and it it re re it'll retain the straightness of them. But other than that, uh, do you want to go for numbers degree number of degrees of freedom? Yeah. I'm wondering, is Olivia going to say something different here? I'm curious. No? You backed out there, Olivia. <laughs> okay. So, um, it is nine as shown here, but what we're actually going to, we're going to find with a lot of these things is that you can set one of those, these arbitrarily, usually this one, to a value of one or something like that. And what we find is that because these are homogenous squares, Oh, you keep losing connection. That's all right. Um, no, I was just curious as to whether you might have come across something like this before or not. Um, so what, what can happen is that we can, we can set one of these values to an arbitrary value and that everything else changes in relation to that. So this is the idea in, in uh, a projection where something could be, um, you know, you know uh, we, we, we can't tell from, from a picture whether it's something big and close up uh, or something, sorry, uh, so, so, something big and far away or something small and close up. And that ambiguity is always there with us in trying to determine when we're dealing with camera views. So when we look at these projective ones, while well, it appears that there's kind of nine degrees of freedom, yeah, the, the, the scaling problem, um, in, in effect, we, we will often deal with just eight degrees of freedom and we, we set that to a one. And that's because of course, we do actually have nine degrees of freedom. It's just that there, there's, there's an ambiguity there. We're never really going to know what that value is. So we often decide arbitrarily to set it to one and work with everything from that. Okay, so that's, that's why I was uh, seeing where, where we were on that, but we'll be explaining more about that later on. That will, that will take a lot, uh, up a lot of our time. And Daniel has a question here. So Daniel, keep typing there, there's no problem.
Oh yeah, don't 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 worry. In a later in a in a later set of notes, that picture is in there, Daniel. I, I'm saving that for so don't 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 steal the punchline. No, it's a, it's a very obvious one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that that's that's no problem. We will come back to that, uh, and hopefully, uh, anybody who's from outside the country will then become a, a lifelong um, uh, um, fan of Father Ted. After that, uh, that's fine. Right. So we've just two slides to go. So um, uh, just. Uh, one thing to kind of keep keep in mind with regard to if we're doing transformations on images and we're moving them back and forth, it can seem an obvious thing to do that what we would do is we would move from our source image to our destination image and we would decide pixel position in the source image, where does that go to in the destination image? That seems the obvious thing to do, but it has a problem associated with it. So yeah, this is referred to as you know going forwards or backwards. So it seems to make sense that whatever our transformation, we would take each input pixel coordinate, transform it with the matrix to find its destination in the new image and transfer the brightness to there. Um, so in other words, you're basically taking the brightness value and you're, you're moving it to some other pixel position. That seems obvious. The problem is that we can actually have a situation where because of quantization, um, a number of our pixels could get, um, you know, rounded down or rounded up and we end up with gaps in our uh, destination image. So we end up with pixels where there's no value there, okay, because two of them both got put into one place, they both got quantized down to there, or some, some other sort of a thing happened of that sort of thing. So we can end up with, with gaps appearing. So the better plan is to actually start with a coordinate in the output image and say, okay, if we did this transformation from the source image, where would it have come from? Okay, so to, to determine where its pixel should be coming from in the input image and copy that over. That way then, no matter what way we quantize it, we will always land on an actual pixel that has a color and take it over. Now that only works within the limits of the image um, if you've, so if you ever do a rotation on an image, uh, let's say you, you take a photograph and the horizon is not perfectly, is not perfectly horizontal, hopefully it's not that bad, but anyway, it's not perfectly horizontal and you want to correct that, you can do a rotation, but what you're going to be doing is you're going to have to crop the edges of the image as well because you've ended up taking pixels from outside the image, which we don't know what those values were because the, the photograph has long been taken and we've lost that information. So as long as you're not going outside the image, this is the better way to go, to kind of work from the destination image, figure out where in the source that would have come from and copy them over in that direction. So to calculate an output pixel comes from the input image, you, you must calculate the inverse, um, you must calculate the inverse of the matrix and multiply that by the output coordinate vector, and this will give you the input coordinate vector. So previously what we were doing in every case was we were, if we go back to my very first um, example here, where I um, I looked at my my uh, transformation that I was going to do, and I multiplied it by my input vector and got my output vector. Instead, what we're going to do is you're going to have to get the inverse of this and multiply it by this output, and that will tell you which input to take your value from. Okay, and you would do this with each of the different coordinates within your image and try and determine it there. That's usually the better plan, otherwise you can end up with gaps and it's simply because of that quantization problem. Okay, um, so I think that's that's it for tonight. So we leave it at that. I think we're just up on the time. So I thought we would have plenty of time left over tonight, but clearly not, and it doesn't matter. Um, hopefully you learned a bit. That's no problem. So as I say, I'll uh, hopefully get some information out to you on your assignment this week, and uh, you. But you, you kind of know what you should be at at this stage, and you can you can start working on it there. Okay.